Welcome to But Jesus Drank Wine and other stories that kept us stuck. I'm Mead. And I'm Christy. In this podcast, we'll explore the stories that kept us, well, stuck, wanting to drink and not wanting to drink all at the same time. Join us as we show you that freedom from alcohol does not have to mean a life sentence of misery and missing out, but actually means living an authentic life full of peace, joy, and purpose. Hi, babe. How are you? Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh. So good. But seriously, like I know you say this, that London is rainy and gray all the time. Um, I'm not used to it. And that is what it has been in Atlanta for. Mm-hmm. It's never been like this. So I am so excited for this conversation that we get to meet up. This is like kind of picking me up today because this weather is killing me. It's killing me. <laughs> Yeah. Every January, there's a, um, did I tell you this? There's like Blue Monday and it's like the second or third Monday in January where it's supposed to be like the darkest, longest day of the year. And sweet Chris, like every, every Blue Monday for the past like five years has sent me flowers because it's in that month in London where I'm just like, why did we move from California? Why are we here? (laughs) Hey, I love, he knows, yeah, he knows how to. Yeah. Cheer you up for sure. I know. I love it. Yeah. We're used to it being sunny and warm by now, but it is not, but yeah, let's, uh, let's have this fun conversation about dun, dun, dun. Yeah. You want to do it? What is it? What is a coach? What, why are we coaches all about like what we do and like, is coaching right for you? And like, I think we just wanted to have this conversation because, well, for a lot of reasons, but because we didn't know that people like us existed when we kicked off on our journeys right did you no no did you no uh-uh. yeah yeah i mean I, like my yeah. only reference like frame of reference for what a coach is is what like you know playing on a field hockey team when you know i was a kid or whatever <laughs> i know <laughs> by playing wait, i mean wait a minute wait. Yeah. yeah wait a minute so you didn't even know what like a life coach was well i mean i knew what a well yes i knew what a life coach was but like what does a coach okay do do you know what i mean like there's a difference between and then there's a difference between like a sports team coach like that's there's a lot of tough love that comes in sports coaching that we do not well at least i do not do in my business tough love is not you know no kind of my method at all but um but i also think it falls along the lines of like how many people like tell you like that they do computer I don't know. That's probably not a good example, but like any job that somebody does that you've never done, are you ever like, like, mm-hmm. but, but what does your day look like that you're do? Like, what does that actually mean? Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's what we get from time to time. Well, often is like, but when do I need a coach? Why, like, why would coaching help me? How does that help me? And what does this actually like this coaching relationship look like? Um, because otherwise they're just jumping into the great abyss and going, Hey, like I'm, I'm along for the ride, but I don't really know what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So true. So good. And so true is what I always like to say on this podcast. I've decided every time I listen to it back, I'm just sitting here saying so good and so true, but I'm just going to stick with it. Um, it is yeah, so I mean, good and so true. <laughs> I did not know that there were coaches, you know, at, like, and I feel like, Definitely here in the UK, it hasn't caught on as much as it has in the US to like have a life coach, have a business coach, have a, I don't know, there's so many different types of coaches now. And I just think part of the real incredible impact that we get to have as coaches, it's very simple and that we just get to sit across, you know, on a Zoom call like we're doing right now and just talk to a friend and talk to someone who's been there before and who has had this struggle. And like, for me, I didn't have one person. I did not have one person that was a Mm non-drinker. I had a girlfriend actually say to me, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to get a whole new set of friends. (laughs) And so I felt very alone and I was doing it during COVID as we know. And so to have somebody just, oh my gosh, I mean, can you imagine if we had each other? Like if I had anybody to talk to, I mean, I would have done anything for that. Yeah, so true. And I, I think that, um, so true, uh, that like the way that I like to describe coaching and kind of how I see what I do, because this is what 
I could have used back when I was starting, you know, this whole thing, this whole journey. Um, like I am a, I'm a professional. I bring my professional experience and I have my personal experience. So I'm a, a professional and that I'm a, a coach, but I'm also like your best friend in that I get where you've been and you know, you can go to your best friend and you can like, even, even if you could bring it to somebody and bring it to your best, best friend, they're going to have maybe some, uh, which by the way, like if you can with a best friend, great. But I know that, uh, you know, before in the past, like best friends, are they going to be honest and totally unbiased in how they see things? Cause, cause here's the deal. This is an uncomfortable conversation to have for people and yeah. so to have somebody sitting across from you that is comfortable in the discomfort of mm. this is what my relationship to alcohol looks like. And I don't know where to begin and help. Like that takes a level of professionalism and someone who's also been there. So I, it's to me, it's like what we do is kind of the marriage of, you know, the best of both being a professional and mm -hmm. like your best friend. That's such a, such a great way to put it. And I feel like when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, there are things that I've told clients um, about my drinking journey that I haven't actually even told my best friends, right? Yeah. Because when you have that moment where they say, and I'm just giving this as an example, and this example hasn't even happened to any of my clients, so I'm making it up. But like, I got in the car with one of my kids when I had had too much to drink. And you just... When you say that to someone else, that they can look back at you and say, okay, but this is also, I had a similar experience or I'm a, I used to be ashamed that I had this experience when I did this, whatever, you know what I mean? And then like, I know, I know how you feel about the, <laughs> talking about shame. So we're going to have to hold the whole conversation for another episode, <laughs> however, for, for the next few minutes, we're allowed to talk about it. <laughs> That shame just evaporates, right? I mean, it's like when you say it in a safe space and you know the other person's not going to like turn around and run and hide or judge you. It's just so powerful. It is so powerful. It's so healing. It's so freeing because when we can have that like radical honesty, uh, you know, with ourselves and in the presence of somebody else who, um, you know, we can we can say words and we can lie with our words like, oh yeah, that's not a big deal. You know, like somebody shares something, you know, I got in the car with my kids and I was driving and I had too much to drink and, you know, they're really, and they've taken, it's taken a lot of courage to share that vulnerably. Right. And they feel the pain of what that looks like to have somebody sitting across from you that's saying, oh, well, that's not big of a, that big of a deal, but yet they're reading mm -hmm. in the person across from them that that person th does think it's a big deal. That creates more shame versus someone who's sitting across from them going, Hey, you've got your stories. Look, listen, how much time do we have? Look at my stories. I've been there. I empathize with you and it's okay. Like I, there is nothing wrong with you. You are okay. And it will be okay. And I think there's a difference, but I think that's something too, that coaching brings that I mean, there are certainly times with my close friends when they've brought something to me, you know, years ago before I became a coach, like it's, they say something and I, a lot of times tell them what they want to hear. Um, mm -hmm. But it's yeah. in that kind of like sharing vulnerably and then, re, you know, connecting in that way, it creates this space for uh, openness and learning and curiosity. Like our, our goal, my goal is to inspire curiosity. When I was in, stuck in the drinking cycle, I wasn't curious about anything. Everything was like, this is the way it is. And there's no room for this. And then here are the rules and here's the rigid, you know, the borders of this and like all these things, there wasn't any wonder, or curiosity and possibility. It was just, this is the way things that things are. And so, um, to inspire curiosity in another means I'm okay sitting with you in the discomfort that you feel about this and, you know, and I have plenty that I can share of my own and I will, and yeah, we'll work through it together. Yeah, that's so good. And it's like when, it's when you are like, how is, how I was saying, you know, I was surrounded by, you know, no one that I knew wanted to look at their drinking, you know, of course, how could I be curious if when I said something like, oh my gosh, I finished the bottle of wine last night, 
to a friend and they say, that's not, big, that's not that big of a deal. I did that last week. Like, how is it supposed to in inspire any sort of curiosity when everybody around you is doing the same thing, which is why I think, you know, as moms in their forties, we get really stuck because it does look normal. And so to have someone else who has struggled, like we both have, who has been like formally trained, um, and who's been doing this for a while, you know, you can, you get a different perspective that like you so beautifully said, inspires a different way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's where we always talk about here, of course, that, you know, it's the stories that keep us stuck. And those stories keep us stuck in unwanted habits and tendencies, uh, patterns of doing things, patterns of thinking. And so, um, you know, when, when coaching with somebody, it's let's untangle these stories that are keeping you stuck in these patterns. Let's identify what these patterns of thinking and what these patterns and habit or behavior look like. Let's bring awareness to them which by the way, we've talked before, like awareness can be this like super painful thing. It's, you know, when we're kind of ignoring it or pushing it aside, it's a little bit easier in a way and also harder. But, you know, once you bring awareness to something, it's like, oh, but then here's this person who is, who number one has, has been there. And then number two um, is helping you kind of navigate those stories and, okay, like borrow my curiosity. You don't know how to do curiosity yet. Okay, I got you. Like, let's, let's take that inner voice that you have that's critiquing, you know, shaming and blaming you, replace it with my coach voice, and eventually it will be a permanent replacement. And then my voice will be your voice. You'll, you will be your coach. Um, but there's, there's so much, uh, I, yeah, so much to it that I didn't even realize when I was like, yeah, okay, I want to coach her. I want to do this. I want to go all in with this. I didn't even realize how incredible uh, this coaching relationship can be. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I think, um, that's a good like transition to talk kind of a little bit, because I know we both get the question, like what, um, why is coaching different than therapy? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that I always tell clients, they can definitely work in conjunction with each other. Um, you know, that therapy very much like works on past and we as coaches really want to look and think towards the future. And the other thing too, that's really different about it is everything that we just said, right? We're going to share with you as a client, just as much as you're going to share with, uh, you know, us as co as your coach. Um, whereas that's obviously a different, you know, a different relationship that you have with your therapist. And then, you know, again, they can work very well in conjunction, but they are different. They are different, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as someone who has had many, many, many years of uh, psychotherapy, professional therapy, counseling, um, and for certain seasons, man, like I, I'm so grateful. Uh, shout out to Charlie in Virginia Beach, my therapist when I was in my early 20s. Oh my gosh. He was just an absolute gem for me. Um, but Something like this for me is like when I was at the, the therapy relation therapist relationships I've had, I felt like I couldn't make decisions or choices or, or do things without like getting the advice from my therapist. I felt, you know, kind of dependent in a way on the professional advice of the therapist. And there was a time and place where that was super, super important and healthy for me. Um, but what I see now and the reason why I have my own coaches, like I, number one, like if you're looking into coaching, find a coach, no matter who it, like find a coach that has their own coaches because yeah, hundred uh, percent to have a coach where, um, you know, they're helping you take forward movement. When you come to coaching, you feel stuck. Okay. How are we going to get you forward moving, getting you into that place of empowerment and discovery and choice when you're stuck, you don't feel like you have a choice. And so you're like, ah, yeah. I don't know. okay, well, am I going to tell you what to do? And then you go do it. Or am I going to help you figure out, I'm going to, you know, give you ideas and find the conflicts in your thinking and allow you to figure out what works for you with the support and guidance. And then you get to choose for yourself. And then that process is, um, you know, more beneficial long-term 
in this, in this way. I mean, certainly again, like not, not to knock psychotherapy because there is definitely a, a place for that. Yeah. What about what, yeah. what, what do you see as like the biggest other than the, or maybe you've, have you, I mean, can I ask, have you had psychotherapy? Oh yeah. Like after my, oh, okay. Yeah. After my mom, after my mom died, definitely. Um, and I think and this is one of the points that I have for us to like chat about, but, um, I saw this gal for a while, but we just like, we're not a good fit. And so, you know, it's one of those things with coaches and therapists, like you have to, you really have to find someone that, that is a good fit for you. Um, but I think, I think the biggest, and I, and I've had therapy before that too, but like, I think the biggest difference is just this aspect, like we started off the conversation with of of the vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? And and like you said, mm -hmm. there's also, I think, a difference between getting professional psychotherapist advice and having someone, as in someone being a coach, ask you the right questions to unlock the answers that you already actually have inside you. You just weren't thinking of it that way, right? Yeah. Which is so powerful. This actually happened to me, where are we, Friday, on a call earlier this week. Um, uh, in our first session, we had kind of been through all of the reasons that this gal thought that she um, liked to drink. And then we got to session two and she said something and I was like, hey, you didn't mention that last week. And she's like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this big, you know, and those big light bulb moments of like, I have been drinking to, sh to numb X and I didn't even realize it. Yes. And it's just so powerful when you just, you can see that light bulb, that unlocking, right? Like, give, do you have an example of something like that's happened and it's just so powerful? I mean, oh. I know you have lots, but pick one. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was just, I was just thinking about the power of finding the conflict in someone's thinking and how, um, you know, I have clients all the time that this is one of like my clues that they're stuck in, you know, conflicted thinking and, my job is to kind of be the person to the detective, if you will, and like helping them peel back where that conflict is. So they see it for themselves and then have that kind of light bulb, like you just said, but, um, this is one of my favorites. I feel like they say, I feel like fill in the blank. I feel like I should know this by now, or I feel like this, you know, um, this should have, that, whatever it is, I feel like blank. When they're saying, I feel like something, they think that they're telling me, because one of my favorite questions, I always ask this, my clients get trained and, you know, we're going to start the call with, what are you celebrating? And, uh, you know, what have you been feeling? And so when I say, what have you been feeling? And they're like, well, I feel like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I feel like it's a thought. And it's important when they say, I feel like, because I can see that means there's a conflict in their thinking, you know, it's, I mm -hmm. feel like this should mm -hmm. be happening, but yet this is happening. Okay. There's your conflict. And then now let's go underneath that. What's underneath that wall. You have this expectation for how this should be and blah, blah, blah. Um, why is that, ex you know, what is that expectation? Where does that come from? What does it point to? How do, how do we shift that? Where is that opportunity? So, so yeah, I, I love that when it's, we're listening, we're, trained and listening for where mm -hmm. that conflict is, because that's 99% of, uh, you know, finding freedom from alcohol is, or really anything is figuring yeah. out where the thinking is in conflict. Yeah. I love that. Let's talk about, um, why coaching isn't scary when we talk about accountability. <laughs> Because I think one of the things that, you know, we, we like to say, or at least I like to say, right, is one of my, my jobs is to hold you accountable. However, <laughs> that comes with a massive dose of grace and compassion, right? Because this is, or at least the way that, you know, the way that we both coach, right, is like the, the goal is to, you know, figure out how you want alcohol to show up in your life, whether that's finding freedom whatever, whatever your goal is, is in relation to alcohol, how you want to feel towards alcohol. Right. And so in, in our coaching, obviously we ask clients, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group to go on a break, but if people have quote unquote slip ups, and I have to call them slip ups. So everyone knows what we're they're talking about, but like, we don't even call them slip ups. Right. So like in the, this naked mind world, we call these data points. And I think we should just touch on that for a minute. Right. Because when you have someone holding you accountable to an alcohol break, 
but then you have, you know, you, you do what you didn't want to do in the first place and you have a drink, like this is not a scary thing, right? We're not I always tell my clients, I'm not kicking you out of the group. I'm not kicking you out of my, <laughs> I'm not going to block you on WhatsApp. It just means we're going to figure out like what happened. I'm like, what can we learn from that instance where you drank and you didn't want to drink? Like, I, I'm sure we'll probably talk more about data points at some point, but like, how are you feeling before? What happened during your day? What, like, did it accomplish that thing that you opened the bottle for? How are you feeling the next morning? Like going through all this stuff. And when you coach with someone that coaches with this lens of like looking at data points, you learn so much from them. They're such valuable like um, sessions, right? Like they're just so good. And it, 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 it just, I think is such an incredible way of coaching people because it's not like, okay, you're here, we're here for 12 weeks, lock away the booze and we're not gonna like think about it or touch it or anything like that. No, we're gonna talk all about it, why you drink it. And if you do slip up, we're gonna learn so much from it that you don't feel like you want to do that thing again, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that you brought up the data points thing because, um, yeah, what traditionally people would call like slips, slip ups, you know, um, like you said, in the in our world, we call them data points. Um, I turned them and we abbreviate them on in the communities and the groups that we do and all as DPs, data points. Um, I turned them into growth points. GPs mm -hmm. because I, it, you know, growth points don't, um, they don't erase all the learning. They create the opportunity for growth from seeing, okay, this is something I didn't want to do. And now this is something I, I, I did. Okay, great. The minute you slip into, oh my gosh, I failed at this. I didn't do this. You're in that shame and blame place where you're in that lower brain, you're not open to learning, you're not curious, you're not collecting that valuable intel that comes along with all the questions that you just asked about, you know, yeah, like what, what were your thoughts before? What were you feeling before? Like, let's, let's collect this data, this intel, because it gives us clues to where there is still that perceived benefit or reward in doing the thing that you don't want to be doing. And so, yeah, taking them as growth points, it's, it's like, no, these are our greatest opportunities. And, you know, in that some people, they come to this journey and they decide that, yeah, I'm going to start now. And it's like the alcohol experiment way, like we've talked about before, where it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to drink and now I'm going to take a 30 day break and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And that's where maybe those data points uh, could happen. Great learning. It's in the learning that we, we get that, or it's, I'm continuing to drink while I'm exploring my relationship to alcohol, because that's where I can keep the shame and blame at bay so that I can actually learn and be curious and, and have that upper brain online to do so. And then they get to a point, like, I mean, that was my journey, you know, it, while I was learning, I was still drinking. And then it was like, oh, there are no more beliefs that alcohol serves me anymore. And so I never really had like traditional data points because I am less before this naked mind all the times so that I tried to take breaks. Um, yeah. But how valuable uh, if I'd known what a data point was in this kind of methodology that we use. Yeah. All those other times I took the breaks and tried not to drink, but then failed, quote unquote, made it to 21 days and not 30. I mean, that only accelerated my drinking because not only did I not follow through with what I said I was going to do, um, but like, I'm still doing the thing that I really don't want to be doing. Oh my gosh. But, but that's the, that's the, the beauty of this method and the coaching relationship in the way that we do it. It's not the tough love, like, okay, you said you weren't going to do that and you did it. And so like, what are you going to do? You know, like <laughs> there is none of that. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. No. It doesn't so, work at all. And, and that's such a great, um, that's such a good like tee up, I feel like to talk about then. And this, I think is really counterintuitive when I say this to people, like you can also start coaching and still be drinking, right? So yes. like you, exactly like you said, could you imagine if you had even a little bit of the knowledge that you, you know, did later on, then when you were you know, in those, like constantly trying to stop or moderate and not know. And that's the thing, these, 
we're going to just call them growth points because that's so awesome. When you have these growth points, um, they're just totally different when you've got the, the knowledge and the and the curiosity behind them as opposed to just like winging it, right? <laughs> like, because you actually learn from them. And so this is a great time that we can talk about the pause, right? So you can start coaching even if you're still drinking. And that is just, it's that those first steps, right? Into curiosity. It's those first steps of like, okay, the shame doesn't work. The beating yourself doesn't work. The constantly feeling like you're a failure, it doesn't work. It's the biggest like way to stay stuck. But if you can just take step out of that for a second and just start to get curious about, okay, how how is this wine really making me feel? Is this wine really helping me be a better mom? Mm -hmm. Is this wine really like helping me feel my best and show up the next day? Or am I living, our favorite phrase, a B minus life because it's getting on the way. And you can still be drinking and have these conversations with the coach. It's just, it's um, it's a great way to like tee it up, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, a great, it's a brilliant method that Annie came up with for, um, act, you know, keeping that upper part of our brains open, uh, you know, and online so that we can actually learn. And, um, I mean, that was, that was my journey for sure. And I, and I think about to like, and I've never thought about it really in these terms before, but I broke up with social media, um, years before I broke up with alcohol. And what I mean is like, I used to, I used to, even if, even though I wasn't like a huge poster, I spent a lot of time mindlessly consuming social media. Yeah. I mean, this has been years and, and I didn't have this awareness for how I, how it was making me feel until, I don't know, at some point I was like, this isn't, there's, I don't know. I don't like how I feel this time of day. I don't like how this is taking over, you know, space, taking up space and me being able to be with my kids or whatever. And I started getting curious about like, how does it make me feel? Do I feel better after I've mindlessly scrolled social media or not? Not once was I able, and I, so I did my own little experience. It's the same thing with coffee. Mm -hmm. we, we've talked about that before too. It's like, I didn't set out to change those relationships, but why they, why I ended up free from them, if you will, um, came from my ability to say, how does it make me feel when I do this thing? It's bringing like consciousness, awareness to what we're doing because it's so easy to be stuck in that mindless consumption of social media, coffee, wine, fill in the blank. Mindless consumption is, you know, that's what keeps us kind of in that trap. So yeah, having, having a coach that can say, okay, like, but how does it make you feel? Let's look at this from like a data standpoint. Um, it's so, it's so valuable. Yeah. Yeah. That experimental mindset is, and anyone that's ever, I think the, a really relatable way to say it to people that are kind of new to this is like, if you've ever looked at like any sort of like food intolerance, right. And tried to remove something mm -hmm. from your diet to see how it makes you feel like that's just kind of what we're doing, but we're doing it with alcohol. Right. Oh my gosh. This is funny. So <laughs> I wrote about my coffee experiment on my social media and someone didn't read the caption, obviously, because it was all about like having this experimental mindset. I would never have been able to do this if I didn't come from it from this angle of like, I'm never saying never to coffee. I'm just seeing mm -hmm. what life is like without it. How is it affecting my body? How is it affecting my sleep? I just wanted to see <laughs> like the tagline of my post was something like I did a coffee experiment and someone was like, now you want us to give up, co up coffee? You're losing friends. And I'm like, that's not the purpose of this post at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, so it's true. about coming from this experience. Like everybody gets to decide, right? What, how, what they, I don't even know what I'm trying to say right now. Like yes. what makes them feel good. And maybe alcohol is not making you feel good. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's a small possibility that it's not serving you. And that's, we just want to have you try it on for size. <laughs> well, yeah. if you're showing up to a space to be coached or to explore your relationship to alcohol, there is a part of you that knows that it's getting in the way and it's not making you right. feel good. So if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> I don't know. I've heard from quite a few people. I've been so surprised how many people are listening that aren't listening from the, I don't know, this is a little sidebar, but um, 
in my life. I'm like, <laughs> how many men and how many people who aren't exploring the relationship to alcohol are enjoying kind of what we're sharing? But and then you think about, well, obviously too, it is so applicable to whatever your habit or tendency or thing that whatever behavior or action that is keeping you quote unquote stuck, it's like, this is like newsflash. Like it's not that thing that's keeping you stuck. It is your thinking. You are stuck in your habitual addictive thinking. And that is, you know, the, for, for me, when I hire a business coach, I expect my business coach to find the, the conflicts in my thinking and my business that are keeping me from, you know, setting up my marketing plan or setting up, you know, this or that or whatever. Ah, yes, it'd be nice if someone would just do that stuff for me. That's a different person, right? That you would source. Yeah. But having the person that's going, okay, why are you blocked in this? Social media, for instance, is one, a big one for me. I come out of training and it's like, oh, you got to use social media. And I'm like, but I don't use social media. I had this big block around. I couldn't bring myself to use social media. My coach was, you know, my business coach was, because you're blocked in your thinking about it. So let's work on that. And I think that is probably the biggest difference too, between one of the big differences between like coaching and traditional therapy. Like we are looking for the thinking because when we shift the thinking, we create the possibility and that creates the shift in the actions. So that's where we disrupt the, the habit loops. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, I'm not sure that that had anything to do with the question or the topic we were just talking about, but you know. No, but it just transitions so beautifully. So we're going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about the, let's roll with it. Let's talk about the difference between, because I know we both coach groups and we both coach one-on-one. -on -one, and I think that there is so much value for different reasons in both of them. Right. Um, I think if. If you're really at a point where you, it's hard to talk about your struggle with even one person, then you're probably looking, you're probably going to want to consider like a one-on-one -on -one relationship, right? Um, and then if you're, if you're someone that really wants to, there's such beauty in group as well, right? Because you get to hear multiple people, right? It's not just me or you telling the other person that this was a struggle. It's many people telling you that this was a struggle. And so there's pieces of other people's stories and group that you pick apart and relate to, which is so beautiful. And um, so, I mean, they're, they're both, they're both so valuable for different reasons. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is, is offer like groups to one-on-one, -on -one, like quote unquote graduates of mine who had like we've wrapped up one-on-one -on -one and it's like okay well now you you want to meet some other gals that are like doing this too and like that works really well um and it's so fun and it just oh i love it so much it lights me up so much because i love talking to these gals um but i think another thing and then i'll like you t i want to hear about your like you know how like your the benefits that you see in both but um one of the things i think it's important to mention is that like when we are coaching you, we are not just sitting with you on an hour long Zoom call, right? We are, I give my WhatsApp. Do you give your Voxer? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, so, As yeah, I was say, so, it's, it's surprising how many people don't take advantage of it. But yes, there is uh, access in between sessions through Voxer. Yeah. Yeah. So but Voxer and WhatsApp, like for anyone that doesn't know what they are, they're just messaging, text messaging platforms, yeah. right? Or voice note messaging like platforms. And so there's that extra element of like, if in between sessions, you feel like you're really stuck or really struggling or have a question on the material that we've given you, or just want to say hi, because we do become friends with our clients. Like that is also you know, such a valuable, valuable tool. And I think with one-on-one, -on -one, obviously that ends up being a one-on-one -on -one messaging relationship and a group, you know, in a group, at least for me, it ends up being a group WhatsApp situation, which are so fun because as an ex cheerleader, I love to see cheerleading going on in my WhatsApp groups, right? It's like, had my first black tie event last night. Here's a picture of me and my, my, you know, gown and my mocktail. And everyone's like, yay, emoji, emoji, emoji. And it's so fun. <laughs> um, that's, well, that brings to like my most favorite thing about the group coaching space is when 
I see this in, in coaching through some this Naked Mind year-long groups. I see this. It's this most beautiful thing when the participants start. And I see it in, I mean, my shorter length groups that I do too, when the participants start coaching each other. It is like to yes. me, I mean, yes. I'm still just thinking about how yeah. that mm -hmm. happens. Everyone is you know starting the group and they're feeling, mm -hmm. but all it takes is someone getting a lo little momentum or someone that's a little bit, um, we hate to say further along or behind or whatever, but just in a different part of the path of journey than somebody else. And that ability to like, I, I don't know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And it's one of the great things about group coaching is it's not just me and Christy sitting, sitting here as those rainbow unicorns who we can't, we never saw me and Christy in when they were <laughs> stuck in the drink. Yeah. Table, what that looked like, but you know, yeah. of, course, of course they got some, I've them. got some pictures. I've got some photos. <laughs> Listen, that's the, one of the benefits of being in my, in my groups. I share those photos. It's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> they are out there, but, um, but it, 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 being with people who are on the journey alongside you in real time, experiencing the things that you're you're feeling, the things that you're thinking, the things that you're doing, having similar experiences in, in, in real time as each other, like there's just nothing more beautiful. And the benefit of the connection that comes through sharing vulnerably. So whether that is in group, that which is huge, and somebody else is, all it takes is one person to share vulnerably, and then everybody else has, feels like they have permission to do so. And that's where another favorite thing for me, just kind of in the group setting, is seeing that snowball um but then the one-to-one -one offers this um i'd say this accelerated customized um journey that really gets to you know we always talk about like it's about alcohol but it's not about alcohol it's it's about yeah. like the stuff underneath it like why am i tapping out of my life why am i you know doing all that stuff and and there's something really um you know, just beautiful too about that one to one where people are bringing for the whole hour all the all the things of their week, and it's like, here, what about this conflict here? What about this conflict here? Some of the yeah. limitations with group is that we can't, you know, do that with everybody. Every do that week. to everybody. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's incredible because the 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 growth and the knownness I feel like is something that um, I think is very special and beautiful too. It's like that knownness that comes from, okay, like I can sit here and I can just bring everything and have this place to like dump it out. And I know that this person sitting across from me is not judging me. And I know that they're going to help me find that little step or two out of stock and give me my little, you know, a tiny new action, a, a little tiny Tina for me to take on my way and then start that momentum back up. So yeah. Yeah different different types for different people but i also agree with the i love the when you've done the one to one and maybe you don't you're maybe you're ready for that group experience that's i love i love being able to put folks over there too yeah let's talk um let's talk about two final things first i want let like, let's talk about um how like coaching is different than like traditional programs that you may have heard of before. And then let's wrap up with like, how do you find the right coach for you? So um, I know when I was like in the real depths of my drinking, <laughs> I was doing some Googling <laughs> and I was looking at rehabs and I was looking at AA and I was looking at all these programs and nothing seemed to feel right for me, right? Mm -hmm. a like a, inpatient rehab felt like my drinking wasn't bad enough like i wasn't yeah. physically dependent on alcohol and i didn't like even know you know again i just didn't think i would like quote unquote qualify for that um and then you know in a kind of traditional 12-step model um the idea of, I know we talked about this in our spicy episode on um, like labels and everything, but I, I didn't want to, you know, admit that I, um, I didn't know that's not, that's not the right wording. I, I didn't associate, like I didn't associate with that label, but also the big thing for me was I didn't want to have to go to meetings for the rest of my life. Right. Yeah. And so 
Let's talk about how like traditional rehab and traditional 12 step and coaching are really different. Um, because like, as we kind of talked about before we hopped on the call, alcohol use disorder is a spectrum, right? And so there, there are, and thank goodness, right? Thank God there's, uh, there actually are a ton of options out there now, right? There, I like feel like there's more than ever. So don't even just take it from me tonight, like go do your research and like find other groups and other coaches. But, but if you're like brand spanking new to this and you only know of 12 step or you only know that you have to go away to a rehab, this is a great alternative for someone that, that just wants to talk to someone with, again, with professional training, who's been there, but also, and the thing that's so great about us is like, uh, I, I know we've talked about this too. Like we end up staying, like making friends with our clients, staying in touch with them for a long time. But like, I don't want to be coaching my clients forever. Like I want you to find freedom and go like, you know, go do life and find your purpose and serve Jesus and be an awesome mom and do all the things. But I don't want to have to like, you know, coach you forever. And you're not going to have to have coaching forever, if that makes sense, right? Because we're going to get to a point and it's different for everybody, but mm -hmm. you're going to get to a point where alcohol just, it doesn't even feel like it needs to be a thing in your life anymore because you realize it has no benefit for you. This is not something that you have to keep on for the rest of your life. And if you don't show up to a, a session, you're going to immediately fall back into this trap, right? Like it's, yeah. that's a, a reason that it's different and that it's powerful. But you, I want you to also obviously speak to like how it's different um, than like traditional methods that most people have heard of. Yeah. I mean, you, you've covered it so well. I, I think um, the, the two things that come to mind for me are um, you know, the traditional methods are behavior-based. It is, here is the thing that I'm doing and let's quit doing this thing. And so yeah. it's about quitting drinking. It's about never picking up the drink again. It's about, um, you know, and to do that requires, men. we've talked about this before too, you know, kind of the willpower method of that it, it's that yeah. like trying every single day not to drink again. When I was stuck in the drinking cycle, I like you did not think I qualified uh, because I hadn't had a rock bottom. My drinking didn't look like a problem, so to speak, to you know to anybody else from the outside. And and so uh, a traditional method where I'm and my big thing was alcohol was taking way too much space in my life. It was taking up time in my thinking, my be like everything. Right, I've, I've gone into that a million times here. Um, to go to something behavior-based, like a traditional method, where it's now going to require a lot of my time and take up a lot of space, mental, real estate, and time, for me, it was like, well, I'm just trading one yeah. for the other. There's no choice there. So for me, that did not feel like it was getting to what I was really looking for, which was for alcohol not to be taking up so much space in my life. So that would be like the kind of the big difference that, you know, I think makes this so appealing to people as well in the space is like, this isn't a, this isn't about quitting drinking. This is about exploring your relationship to alcohol and figuring out what freedom from alcohol looks like to you, because you can be alcohol free. You can live sober, i.e. alcohol free. But if you're still thinking about it and using willpower and trying every single day not to drink, are you free mm -hmm. or you can be free from alcohol because you've changed your desire to drink. Therefore, there's no temptation. Therefore, there's no, you can look at alcohol. You can be around it. You can look at that old bottle of Sonoma Contrera and be like, oh my gosh, you could not pay me to drink that. Um, that for me was freedom. It's going to look different for everybody else. So, it, and, and if you look at kind of the difference too, and why I think this becomes a very accessible approach for people is because there's, there aren't those rigid rules. This isn't a rules thing. So there is no, oh, I, I, I had a data point and now I've, you know, I've got to start counting my days over again. That brings on more, like we talked before, like yeah. shamefully making it doubly hard not to do the thing that we don't want to be doing. Whereas this is, no, like as long as we're keeping in our upper brain and that openness, that curiosity, we can explore this and we can get to the reason why 
alcohol is taking up so much space in our life because it's not because there's something wrong with us or we, you know, are an alcoholic or we have a, you know, that disease or we're like, like, it's not any of that. We believe there's a reward. There's some perceived benefit to doing the thing. And so that's where the thinking comes in. And the, and the other part of, you know, that I would say like where the similarity is, uh, I was talking to a client recently who was telling me that she has a, a friend who has had, she has, you know, had success with AA over the past couple of months. And, and I, and I was really curious, you know, we've talked about this before where like, we'd love to talk to people who have had experience and very successful, positive experiences with the traditional methods, because usually we're getting people that maybe have tried it and haven't been successful. And, you know, what does that even look like? But she was saying that what she has loved about it is because she's found this amazing group of women, um, that she gets to like kind of do life with, right. And like, she gets to feel this connection too. And she got lucky where she lives that in her space, like there is, and then now it's this really cool thing. Like when you're out and about and you see each other, you know, in different social settings, like you're kind of like in this insider's club. I loved hearing that so much because I think yeah. that it goes to, it speaks to what's maybe the most important thing in creating maybe a successful freedom from alcohol relationship is connection. And that's what, whether it's one-to-one -one connection with your coach, you do develop, you know, that, that bond or whether it's connection through group coaching, like we offer, or whether it's, you know, connection through an AA group or a traditional programming setting connection to other humans, knowing that you're not alone. That is probably the most healing thing we can do for the, for the shame. And if you think about the role of evil and how evil does its best work. Evil wants us to be alone and hiding and, you know, isolated. That's where evil does its best work. That's where shame comes in. That's where fear takes over. That's where we're more separated from the Lord. And so finding a space where you can be connected to another human or humans who, like we kind of started, you know, started this with, like who get it, that I think is probably the most powerful part of this, this whole kind of process. That was a real, that was a really yeah. long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was so, it was so good though. And I love the way that you differentiated, like, you know, the behavior versus like, you know, the mindset and, and it's true because obviously we know, and we've said it before, willpower doesn't work. And so, um, that's so good. So let's just wrap up really quick by, by saying a couple of things about like, how do you find a coach that will work with, that you resonate with, that you connect with? Um, I think it's finding someone, you know, with a relatively, and it doesn't have to be the exact same, like similar story, right? It's like, I say on my website that I equip and encourage moms, you know, with grace, compassion, and a sprinkle of science, but I've also coached a lot of, you know, women that don't have kids. But so it's, I think, you know, finding someone with a similar story um, and just take that leap, you guys, because everybody that I know in the coaching world, and that's pretty much within the, this Naked Mind community, but we all offer discovery calls for free. So feel free, right, to to reach out and, and see who you connect with and see who you feel like you could be open and vulnerable with. Um, uh, I think that's so important. What about you? Yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I, I think what, um, what I love is, and I'm always surprised too, like, you know, I work with males, you know, I'm very much, you know, it looks like I'm the, the mom of, you know, with the young kids kind of coach, but I coach males, I coach, um, some of my favorite clients are my, my older women clients. Oh my gosh. So I feel like I'm the one that benefits most from those yeah. coaching relationships. Yeah, they have so, so much true. wisdom, wisdom. And yeah. that just fills me. But, um, you know, I would say like, so this is what I do when I'm, when I've looked for coaches before and before I kind of landed on the ones that I have as my regulars, but, um, looking for a coach who has their own coaches, who's done the work, who is doing the work still. And so when we talk about doing the work still, I don't mean still working on changing their relationship to alcohol. Obviously that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing this, what I call forever work, the forever work of, uh, 
thinking about our thinking and how our thinking is contributing and influencing how we're showing up in the world and where, you know, when our values are uh, not aligned with our actions, that's where we create our stress, our conflict. And so finding, so that's an ongoing journey. I mean, my thing was with wine. I mean, there are other, other things that get in the way now. And so having a coach who also is actively in the work, doing the work, in in committed to growing and um forward yeah, movement themselves good. i think for me and all the coaches i've tried that makes the biggest difference for me um so yeah i would say look for someone who's doing you know maybe that's a question you ask like do you have your own coaches and what is that how have you used coaches because um we all we are not you know we're not objective when we're in it we can't be objective for ourselves. And so having somebody else that can be that objective, like here, this is what I see for you. And being that mirror, when you're feeling that conflict with whatever it is, having someone sitting across from you who can be that mirror that says, reflecting back to you that like, you are amazing. You are enough. You are worthy. You are beautiful. I know you don't feel that right now. I know you don't, I know you feel helpless. I know you feel all of the the pain and the all the all of that that comes with it but like see me looking at you uh with delight in my eyes and um you know with kindness for where you are because i get it i've been there and by the way like we can do really hard things mm. infinitely longer if we don't yeah. have to do it alone and so yeah look for the look for the coach that suits your um, and don't, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to multiple. I love that. I'm not going to yeah. be the right coach for a lot of people. You know, you're not like, it's, that's what I love about this space too, is there's so many different, different coaches, like find the person that you feel like you, you know, relate to and start there. Yeah. Um, we have to wrap up, but I think our tiny Tina and one of Mead's clients or friends said, She's now calling it the tiny Tina Turner. <laughs> I love that it's morphed. <laughs> it's morphed, guys. It's morphed. So the tiny Tina Turner, I think, <laughs> should just be like, start start getting curious about coaching groups, all the methods. We're not telling you what to do here. We're just telling you that we're an option. And so go do some research. That's, I think, what the tiny Tina should be. What Do you, do you have anything to add to the Tina? Yeah, I was thinking too for uh, for for Tiny Tina Turner that we can pick up and put in our pockets today um, would be you know like is your voice the voice of an inner critic or an inner coach? And if your voice is more sounding like an inner critic, what could the voice of another coach of a coach do for helping you train? train away from the inner critic into the inner coach voice. I love, I love, love, love when my clients and my group members say like, I had your voice in my head, you know, today when I did X, Y, Z, like I heard you saying this, this, and this. And I'm like, by the way, I'm really sorry because, you know, we all hate our own voices, but um, I'm also like, <laughs> good, use my words, use my voice until that becomes your default. Your voice, yeah. Because what we're doing is we're disrupting the old patterns of thinking and habits that come along with that, and we're creating new. That's what the whole Tiny Tina is. Let's create tiny new actions and start training our minds towards uh, new results from there. So, yeah, that's that's what I would say. Tiny Tina. Love it. <laughs> well, we hope that you enjoyed this one, ladies. We will see you next Monday. Don't forget that if you'd like to connect with us further, you could join our community. Um, and we'd love to see you there. Speaking of connection, and and that's the other thing, right? Speaking like I love that you said that. Yeah. And I'm gonna go just two more minutes here. Um Free, free communities. It doesn't, you don't have to do paid groups. Yeah, like yeah, start, start yeah. with a free community. Oh my gosh. What a valuable space, which they're valuable when there's engagement, when people, you know, start that going. So join, join our community or a different free community. Start that process of connecting to other people who've been there, who are on the journey with you. I promise you, you will feel so much better. It takes some vulnerability, some courage to do so. 
that it is a great, great first place to start. Maybe a last place too. Like maybe that's all you need. Great. Love that. All yes. right, ladies, we'll see you next week. Bye, babe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. You can find all of our episodes at butjesusdrankwine.com. And make sure you follow us over on the gram at Love Life Sober with Christy and Mead at I'm Not Sober, I'm Free. To learn more about what we do, you can visit our websites at meadhollandshirley.com and lovelifesober.com. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't have to worry about missing a single episode. And if you love what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. This helps more women who are feeling stuck and alone in the overdrinking cycle to find hope and encouragement. Thanks, ladies. We so appreciate you. We'll see you next week.